All right, well, um, we can go ahead and get this started. Uh, the first ever, I guess, Google Lounge uh, to introduce a Tansler. Uh, so we'll start off with the introductions. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Dr. Deborah Saunders White. I have the pleasure of now serving at uh, North Carolina Central University's 11th Chancellor. I am the first uh, female uh, permanent chancellor to serve uh, this institution. So it is with great delight and honor that I step into the job today. Uh, we are making history today in a lot of ways. This is the first electronic chat I think we've had with the chancellor. So I'm delighted to be joining you uh, virtually and look forward to all of your questions. Um, well, we'll start off start off with myself um, as far as student introductions. Uh, my name is Stefan Weathers, student body president here at North Carolina Central University for the 2013-2014 academic school year. Olivia. Hello, everyone. My name is Olivia Robinson, and I am assistant director of academic affairs for Central SGA. And also, we have uh, another person in the room as well. Um, another student, uh, Chelsea Graves. Uh, Chelsea, you want to come around? Come around. Can we, can we figure yeah, we can out how to work you in? There we are. Hello, everyone. My Chelsea. name is Chelsea Graves. Chelsea, why don't you tell folks what you're doing here? Um, what I am doing, I am a psychology major. I am a rising junior. I'm a chancellor, Saunders White, transition team, and I'm also assistant to Stefan Weathers. Wonderful. Um, and we can just go ahead and get this, get this thing started, get it rolling. Um, I don't know if anyone has a, a starter question. If you have a starter question, I know I have something I want to ask myself, but um, do either of the other two uh, students present on the call uh, have a question that they would like to ask the chancellor at this time? I did have a, mine is more of a, a personal question. We can get that to, you know, some of the, uh, I guess, more pertinent things, but mine was just a pers personal question. What do you um, love to do um, in your spare time? Well, I know you don't like to have you know, <laughs> free time. I want those people too. But what do you like to do if you happen to have those moments where you're free in your schedule? Well, I actually had 30 days in between my opportunities at the Department of Education and assuming the responsibility here at North Carolina Central University. So within those 30 days, I read about six different books. So I love to read. I love cooking. Um, you know, my, my family will tell you she doesn't like to slow down, so I really do enjoy the work that I do. So I've been anxiously awaiting today, ready to get started. Um, but I guess if I had to say something, it's probably, you know, just reading and cooking. I am a sports advocate, so, but I'm more of a washing person. I'm more of a football kind of gal. But. Oh, you're more of a football I am. I, I love the fall. I love, uh, I love the gridiron. So, so I love all sports. Okay. I love, um, I love uh, both basketball and football. You do? So, yeah. How about track and field? I do. I yeah, do. I'm a track and more field. Of, yeah, more of a fan of uh, my friends in track and field um, than some of the, I guess, higher, um, higher levels in Olympic. But you know, one of the wonderful things here about this institution is that we've got some great athletes engaged in all kinds of sports. I mean, our tennis team has done extraordinarily well, our baseball team, our softball team, our volleyball teams. So one of the things that I'm going to enjoy as chancellor is just getting to all of those programs and being a part of all of those activities. Um, some, some sports I know better than others. Um, I like to think I'm a golfer, but others tell me I'm really not. <laughs> so, um, but I do, I, I'm looking forward to just being uh, completely involved in, in all of those activities and, and attending those, those events. Definitely. Um, so, since you are a sports sports fan, not necessarily SEC, but who do you have? Um, I guess Wayne tonight's game, the Heater. Uh, the oh my God, that's a hard question. Um, okay, if I really do I have to really miss it out. You can go, go Indiana. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
we have a chance for this, you know, very smart and her, you know, uh, sports decision. <laughs> <right, sports decisions. laughs> I, okay, I have a question. I was actually reading on Twitter, I think Stefan's page, that um, somebody had said HBCUs hinder African Americans. Now, do you agree with that? And if not, why? I absolutely do not agree with that. I think HBCUs have had a rich history um, in our country and continues to serve a meaningful purpose. If you look at the, the landscape, HBCUs represent about 3% of the institutions of higher learning in the academy. But we graduate 13% of all African Americans in the country. That's a tremendous um, uh, a responsibility that we have. HBCUs have always been a haven for the underrepresented communities in our society. And um, unfortunately, we still live in a community where we have uh, an underrepresented population. So we will continue to serve a purpose. I think that what we have to, um, to do as a community is to ensure that our academic programs are relevant to our global society. And if you take a look at what we have done here at Central, we have done that extraordinarily well. We sit within the research triangle area. We have always been a very strong liberal arts institution. We took that foundation and we layered STEM education on top of that with two very vibrant research um, uh, uh, institutes that are here. We live in a city that touts itself as a city of medicine. We are uh, engaged in uh, health disparities and health education. Um, we are at the apex of all of those activities. So not only do I disagree, I fervently disagree because our institutions are more relevant today than they ever have been. You are leaving this institution as leaders, as global leaders in our community. That's our responsibility to, to you. Our alumni clearly have demonstrated the value of their educational experiences within their communities and within our global society. So, but we cannot rest on our laurels. We cannot rest on where we have been. We have to be agile. We have to be continue to be relevant. We have to continue to ask ourselves, how can we be better in those pursuits? And so, absolutely, uh, I absolutely disagree with those comments. So you talked about, um, I guess, the HBCUs as a whole being more relevant now than possibly they ever have been. Um, how can we continue to uh, make that message clear? How can we continue to advance as an institution so that um, that narrative is actually something that uh, is considered truth to the people who see that? Well, we're in an interesting time. Um, we are, um, we have to continue to forge the, the truth that higher education is a public good. That's first. 80% um, of all folks who are educated in our society come from state-supported institutions. And so we've got to uh, continue to convince our, uh, our state houses to invest in higher education. 40 states last year de-invested in higher education. So we've got to have those conversations. As we talk about that conversation, how pu pu uh, uh, higher education is indeed a public good, we then need to start talking about how we segment that market and what role HBCUs can play in that regard. That means that not only are we at the table talking about higher education uh, within the academy uh, uh, at, at state houses, but we're also at the table talking about how we can continue to fund public education through, uh, as well as uh, HBC, HBCUs. Uh, we need to do that at the state level. We need to take that conversation 
to Washington, and I was most recently there, to ensure that we get the funding that we need, not just from the Department of Education, but from all agencies within that federal uh, space. We need to take our conversation to corporate America and to make sure that they understand that we are training some of America's best. Therefore, the best investment they can make is in our enterprises. And then we need to go to the philanthropic community and ensure that they understand that we deliver a tremendous return on investment. So all of that said, you know, clearly it's the chancellor's job to be out there to be an advocate, but students are our best assets. You, when you return to your communities, you've got your maroon and gray on, you need to, to continue to talk about the positive experiences you're having here at your institution, what you are going to be able to provide to the economy once you leave this institution, and, and then how you intend to give back as alumni of this institution. So it's a conversation that the chancellor, students, faculty, staff, everyone needs to be engaged in. We need to take the North Carolina Central brand uh, out there. And we need to, to make sure that we are talking about our distinctiveness. We need to be able to talk about the quality uh, of programs that we have and the quality of experience. When we were the first institution in the country to get state support. And we need to maintain that uh, those uh, supports, uh, that support moving forward. Um, how do you plan to improve the retention rate? You know, that's a that's a big question. Um, you know, there are a couple of, for me, there are two retention rates. There's the freshman to sophomore, and then I think that there's the, the sophomore to, to junior. And, and what really happens on the first one is making sure that we've got the proper advisement in place, making sure that students have the course loads that make sense, and then helping them make that transition from a high school experience into, you know, uh, 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 into higher ed. So we need to make sure that we've got folks in place to provide the nurturing environment to help students when they are uh, in trouble, if you will. I had a student who emailed me over the weekend and said, I was embarrassed to ask for help. So whatever happened with that student, we've got to make sure that we take away that environment so that that student could indeed seek the help and uh, advice that they need from faculty. The students have to be a part of that process too. You know, you've got to see your, 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 your compatriots out there. and You've got to say, I think you're struggling, let me help you. Let me help guide you. So student mentorship is, is, uh, is uh, uh, a big part of that. So I'd like to see us continue to do more of, of that. Um, now, What's important, I think, what happens to students as they continue to engage the institution and move through is that, you know, we've got that retention rate between sophomore and junior. And that's when I call life starts to interfere a bit. And really the most uh, important aspect of the living uh, uh, dynamic is finances. You know, we do a great job in giving a freshman support coming in the door, and somehow our resources start to dwindle. The students have to engage in more loans. They have to uh, understand the financial aid process more than they ever have before. And some students just cannot get through that maze. So one, we've got to help them um, in that regard. The other piece that we've got to do is we just got to have more scholarships. Um, and I'm committed to working very hard to, uh, to build that scholarship base so that we can make sure that we don't lose students because they just can't afford it. I think that that's one of the beautiful parts of that historically black institution is that we don't let people fall through the cracks. That's what we have done for a century or more in this country. 
And so what I'm hopeful that we will be able to do here in terms of our retention rates is that we will be able to help students see that there is indeed a pathway to the end. I'm committed, you heard me say this morning, to four years. But you know, many of your students come in with, I mean, you guys come in already with AP credits and dual enrollment, and you've got a nice uh, a portfolio of academic offerings when you come to us. We've gonna, we're going to work through that and make sure that if the answer is four years, or maybe it's three years in some cases, because the portfolios are so strong. Um, and so I'm hopeful that we will be able to, to do that. I'm hopeful that we will engage our summers more. Uh, I know that that gets to be a, a struggle because the federal government took away Pell in the summer. Uh, so, uh, you know, I understand the realities of how difficult that that will be for us to engage. But we've got to, to use our summers. We've got to use these huge breaks that we have, and I know that you love them. But if uh, for those that would like to take a course in a, in a J term or in a, a semester break, We've got to give you the opportunities that you uh, can uh, take advantage of that clearly allows you to move through this enterprise in three or four years. That, um, that having been said, let me, let me say that's going to take some, again, I talked about scholarship, that's going to take money to help make that happen. And also it's going to take our faculty to, uh, to look at how we provide our courses. You know, a lot of cases, you know, I know in some institutions I've been to, you know, course X is only offered in the spring, um, and you're trying to, or maybe only offered in the fall, and you don't find that out until later, which causes you to add another semester. If I'm saying something that, that's not true, you stop me. Uh, but um, but we've, got to, we've got to have better analytics that allow our department chairs to um, schedule uh, courses so we know the demand for the course and we can schedule them so that you can take them so you can meet, um, you can meet that, that term. So retention and graduation really goes hand, go hand in hand. We can get our retention rates up from the freshman to, to sophomore year in the 80s. I, you know, I can tell you that our graduation rates will dramatically increase. And so right now we're at a 60, up 64, I think is what I remember uh, about that retention rate. So we have a ways to go, but we've, so we've got to interview uh, students and find out why they're leaving, what's what what the issues are, and um, and, and uh, intervene early enough so that we can we can help uh, uh, retain our students. So there's a everybody plays a role in that, and believe it or not. You know, even uh, staff play a role in, in retention. I can, I, I reflect back on some of the times I, you know, way back when, uh, uh, light years ago, in the Stone Ages when I was in school. Um, <laughs> you know, I can tell you the staff at the institution where I went made a difference, encouraging us to continue on and encouraging us to, you know, just um, you know, continue to, to make the sacrifices to move, move forward. So everyone needs to be engaged. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a heavy lift, but one we have to have to make. Thank you. Okay, I did have. Well, this will probably be um, the last question that we ask, uh, just for the sake of time. I know you have a busy schedule. Uh, you might. Have, I think you have four o'clock. But since you talked a lot about funding and uh, money and scholarships. Um, how specifically, and this relates to alumni as well, how specifically can uh, we bridge that gap to continue um, the funding that alumni bring in uh, for, for those specific scholarships for students? How can we bring in outside sources and funding uh, more than what we have uh, in the past? Well, what I'm hopeful that we will be able to do um, this year is to evaluate our capacity to really uh, launch a comprehensive or a capital campaign. It would be one of the first that we've done in our history, but it allows us to, in a very strategic way, go out to the community to raise uh, resources. The primary need that, that I see will be for scholarships. 
and so we would work, um, you know, we would uh, talk about our areas of excellence, our areas of need. Uh, we would put that portfolio together. We would have to do a necessary research and tar be very targeted in our discussions and be very aggressive in how we uh, uh, and, and what we ask um, for help in. And, 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 and what better return would any investor have in an institution like North Carolina Central University? We're asking donors to invest in you. And you are our prize asset. You, our students, are going to provide, you know, change to this global community that nobody has ever seen before. And, and those that don't take advantage of that are going to feel like they missed something. I guarantee you. So we're going to be very strategic. To answer your question, to be very specific, we're going to be very strategic. We're going to lay out our, our areas of distinction. We're going to lay out our areas of need. We're going to target not just our alumni, but corporations and foundations and the federal government and state enterprise um, and ask them uh, to help us so that we can provide you the opportunities that you need to be successful whether that's in scholarships, better facilities, um, world-class faculty, uh, all aspects of the spectrum of the academy. Well, um, like I said, that was the last question uh, for the Google, the Google Hangout chat. Um, we'd like to thank um, Chancellor, not Chancellor now, <laughs> Deborah Saunders White, uh, for joining us and taking the time to spend with students uh, some students uh, who had you know, pressing questions to ask you. Well, so we thank you so much, Stefan. Absolutely. Thank you, Chelsea. I appreciate it. All righty, guys. Have a great afternoon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.